Hey, this is the franchise, Shane Douglas. Welcome to Appalachian Expose. I told you I'd bring my buddies here, Curtis Hughes, Rhino. Now look what I got sitting here. D'Lo Brown, how long have we been friends, D'Lo? 20, 22 years, 23 years, I mean, something like that. A long time. Forever. Right? Yeah. Look, I, and full disclosure, I sat in a civic center. The Philadelphia Civic Center, I watched this man wrestle. No, no, no. Like, shh, 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 shh. No, no, no. But he's one of the guys. You were, you were working me that night. I was working him. <laughs> but in full disclosure, he was one of the guys where I was like, man, that looks so fun. Thank you. Like, that looks so good. Thank Although you. I was there for the famous night with you and Johnny Ace. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Because <laughs> we now have another validating source that was there, first-hand source. I, I, look, I, I've always told you guys, when we do these, this what you're watching is this the boys on the road. Uh, this is what we do. When we, first time I met D-Lo, any of the friends. We get in the car, mm -hmm. Cadillac, Seville, uh, uh, Lincoln Town car, we're driving down the road for, yeah, it's breaking the business. This, this is what we do on the road. So you're getting a first inside look. So we'll start there. What led you to want to be a wrestler? Um, I was a fan of wrestling since the time I was nine years old. I, I saw it and and I remember uh, seeing Dusty Rhodes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Face bloody. Yeah, yeah. Um, crawling over. I remember one, one of the first matches that I remember watching live on TV, or not live on TV, but in full was, it was a, and it hasn't been done since, it was a match between the Rock and Roll Express and the Russians with the NWA World Tag Team titles. The Russians were the champion. The match went 48 yes. minutes. So in an entire hour of TV, yeah. And, and then they ended it with about five minutes to go, so a rock and roll win, and I just watched Ricky Morton, and then all of a sudden they threw in an enhancement match, because Gordon Soli goes, well, we have more time allotted, so we, and they threw in a, a secondary match, yeah. but the way it was portrayed like sport. Right, right, right. And, and yes. the feeling I got watching, watching Ricky get his ass beat, mm -hmm. and then finally watching Ricky and Robert take down these two monsters. big monsters, yeah. I was like, this is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Like, it gave me that, those goosebumps. I'm curious, were you a comic book mark as a kid? Yes. See, I, I was too. I used to sit, uh, especially hot days, I'd be in the shade, boy, I'd be yep. reading my, started buying them when they were 15 and 20, then remember they jumped up to the Starburst. It's yes. still 25 cents. I, I, I would go, I would wait at my local 7-Eleven. Yeah, yeah. Because a new comic book delivery day, I would wait for the guy who brings them, <laughs> yes. so then I could go grab, be the first one to grab it off the off the rack. Yes, it's made, ours was a stop and go, right? Okay. You go over there, take your dollar allowance, go over there and buy four comic books and sit all day and read them. The first time, I'd been a fan of wrestling when I was younger, six, seven, eight years old, studio wrestling. Mm -hmm. And Bruno and Dominic and all of those guys, Haystacks, Calhoun. Uh, but then I stopped watching it, you know, just sort of outgrew it a little bit. Uh -huh. We got cable in Pittsburgh in 1976, I was 13. My dad got it when we were, I never knew my dad was a wrestling fan. So he's reading the, you know, the uh, TV guide and he said, hey, wrestling's on tonight at midnight, Saturday. Mm -hmm. The WOR feed out of, out of New York, which we could never see in Pittsburgh. Oh, WOR, out of Secaucus, yes. Yes, and I remember sitting down on the floor here on my back, my dad was laying on the couch. It's one of those like magic moments from your childhood, like thinking mm -hmm. about your parents. You know, I never knew my dad to watch TV, let alone to want, want to watch wrestling. And the very first segment, as fate would have it, was superstar Billy Graham, the Grand Wizard, with his fez and his sunglasses. Mm -hmm. And he had a, he, there was a cage in front of him, and he was wrestling with Bruno coming up, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, this, he Billy looked like a Thor come to life. Okay, right? Those muscles, the tan, the. the get the gab, the presence, I mean, it was like I was a fish on a hook line going, yeah. man, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen yeah. in my life. And at the end, he took a head of cab, San Martino, this is what I'm going to do to you, and he's great. Right across the steel. Oh, my yes. God. I was thinking, this is unbelievable, but, okay, so you were a fan, all this, yes. come of it, but there are tens of millions of fans mm -hmm. that watched you and watched all of us. Uh, what was the linchpin that made D'Lo believe, okay, Instead of just being one of those guys that thinks about it, I'm going to actually try to do it. Ron Simmons. Seeing Ron Simmons win the WCW World Championship let me know that guys who look like me yeah. could actually do this yeah. and be successful. Because, and, and let's full disclosure, up until Ron, right. um, young black men were just used as enhancement yes. talent. Mm -hmm. You know, and they would, get their, they would get their ass beat. And who wants to aspire to get their ass beat? <laughs> right. you know, I don't know anyone who goes, yeah. I want to be that guy who gets his ass beat on yeah. national TV. Yeah. But then you see a guy like Ron Simmons and Butch Reed go out there and... and Butch and Albert, we just watched them. Yeah, God rest his soul. Great guy. Um, but you see guys like that go out there and you're like, holy hell, yeah. a guy like me can actually do this. Yeah. And I remember telling my sister, I remember sitting down watching TV, I was 11 years old, and I said, 
I said, LeBeer, I'm going to do that. Really? This is what I'm going to do. And I remember, I remember 14 years later, I was 25, she looked at me at the Philadelphia Spectrum and went, you did it, didn't you? Yeah. I was like, yeah, I did. Cool. Yeah, I did. Cool. See, like for me, I tell people the story, and I know people think it's like a, like a fan would think, like, oh, you're just saying it's trying to be like humble or whatever. Mick and I, fully, trained mm -hmm. Dominic School. Yep. A bunch of Cody Michaels, Brian Hildebrand. Uh, oh, Brian, Brian Hildebrand. Oh, God, great. sorry. Yeah, great guy. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. So we, you know, Dominic was always putting me and Mick on first. Mick was a great heel. Mm -hmm. I was a, you know, typical white meat baby face. We go out there and do the stuff, and a good curtain jerk match. And we knew we were good for that. We could do a little indie uh, stuff. But I remember us having conversations in Dominic's school like about Brett or whoever was on, you know, big at that time. And thinking like, okay, we're good for this, but we can't ever do that. Like that's right. way above our reach, right. you know? And uh, so, I, I don't want to make it about me, let's get back to you. So you make this decision, you go, where's your train? Um, well, full disclosure, I'm a backyard. My friend and I, Tom Carter, he was actually in the business too. Um, he wrestled under the, the name Reckless Youth. He was the indie darling um, in the early uh, 1992, three, four, and up to injury kind of took him out of the, the fray around then. But um, I was a backyarder and then... Uh, no, when you say backyarder, I'll cut you off. When you say backyarder, did you guys have a ring or was this rolling we, on no, the it, it was, it the was, it was No, it was literally, let's go to the high school football field and have a match on the 50 yard line. Let's go fun, let's yep. go fun. Uh, and then I moved away from it, went to college, and then um, I remember reconnecting with Tom, and they were still doing it. Mm -hmm. But now they had elevated up where they would rent Larry Sharp's ring. Wow. Okay. Once a month or so for 50 bucks. So now, now, now you're getting Yeah, this is, this is real. Yeah. So for 50 bucks an hour, we would, you know, rent the ring. And I was working as an accountant in New York, so I could afford 50 bucks. How old at this time? I am uh, 23, 4. Okay. Right there. Yep. Um, so this is 93, 94. It's about turn 94. Oh. Um, and so I, I could afford 50 bucks. Hey, I'll chip in. Sure. So we would rent a ring once a month, once every two months, and we put it on our pay-per-views. We had paper mache belts. We had a, the whole deal. <laughs> and we re we recorded like this is our this is our SummerSlam. Yeah. Um, and so finally one time Larry Sharp stuck around to see. You know, I'm I'm, I'm going to make 200 free bucks. Yeah. How am I going to do this? So he, he looked at me. He goes, Hey, you're after it was done, he goes, hey, you're pretty athletic. You ever think about doing this for real? And I was like, me, for real? He goes, yeah. he goes tell you what, kid. You sell 50 tickets, and I'll have you on the next show. So, uh, and this is the God's honest truth. I sold four, bought the other 46 myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I was on his show, and that was Two May minutes. 7th, 1994. I wrestled a guy named Dave Dutch in the opening match. There you go. Made it, you found you dug the hole through the wall. I I, I dug I dug the hole through the wall, and there May seventh, uh, I went from a I went from backyarder to let's go try this. Launch of a career. And and from that point forward, it has been onward and upward. I it was the tickets were ten dollars a piece, so I bought the other forty six. The, the best four hundred and sixty dollars I've ever invested <laughs> in my life. Now here here's the the question you know that so you have okay. These young kids coming in, and this is the question I'm, I'm always, I'm still after all these years, this Thanksgiving, by the way, will start my year in the business. <laughs> so, uh, we all, we go, like, in my case, I went to Dominic School, you Larry Sharp School, you know, each of us had, had our own routes that way. So, is it, like, what comes first, chicken or the egg? So, is it something special and just those talents that make it, or was it every kid comes out of school and has those same building blocks, it's the ones that utilize. So in other words, you learned to do a body slam at Larry's mm -hmm. school. I did, Kurt, we all right. learned the same. So at, at, at the moment leaving that school, if I said, do a suplex, okay, do a suplex, do a body slam, okay, do a body slam. We all knew how to do the moves. What is it do you think that separates the ones that knew how to do the moves to suddenly those ones that you're watching the television and you can't take your eyes off of? You know, that's that's the, the million dollar question. Um, Cause we all want to know what that it thing yeah. is. What yeah. is that it thing that separates yeah. us, me from that dude, you from that dude. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm looking over there, Curtis Hughes, I'm looking at you. There were probably 
10 kids in your wrestling class who never went anywhere. Right. Same thing with Curtis Hughes, and I can say the same thing for me. Um, is, and I'm gonna answer your question with a question, is it that we have our own spin on the way things are done? Is it we're more comfortable being out there in the limelight, being out there in front of people? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that thing is. Yeah. I wish I did because if I could teach it, Bill Gates' bank, <laughs> bank account would have nothing on mine. See, like literally. See, I, I'm reaching. But I used to tell myself as I was like I told my son he's he's gone to national to try his music. Connor mm -hmm. Martin, by the way, and uh, he. I told him I said just about everybody in the business was bigger than me. Yeah. Most of them were more athletic than me. Mm -hmm. uh, probably 99.9% .9 of them stronger than me. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't one in the business that outworked me. I, I, they'd be in the bar at night and I'd be in my room going, okay, the tonight's match, what did I do right, what did I do wrong? Like, like anal about it, just learning, trying to learn my craft. Uh, so I think there's a big part of that that goes into it. But now, that, that was when I was younger, the way I thought. Mm -hmm. As I've gotten older and look back at my career, it almost looks as if somebody, somewhere, was going, okay, let's build this kid and we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. We're going to add this block. Yeah. Now he's going to let's put that block in there. Because at every key point in my career, you know, I'm a young snug-nosed kid that reads comic books and I meet Dominic DiNucci. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, work, get my break in the business with UWF and Bill Watts and work with Pez Watley, Dick Slater, Dick Murdoch, you know, go on down to Eddie Gilbert uh, every night. Right. Then go to the W, well, NWA then, uh, Dusty Rhodes, Magnum TA, Rock and Roll Express, Midnight's, all these guys are walking around and working. At each point in my career, it's almost like, okay, hey, this kid needs experience in front of bigger crowds to put him in WCW. Mm -hmm. Do you think that way about your career? I do completely because um, at each stop along the way, um, and I think it's the trait of a learning individual, you should pick up on every yes. place you go Amen. from everyone you're around. So. When I was at Larry Sharps, there was Chris Candido, there was Balls Mahoney, okay, and then... So you were there with those guys at the yes, same time? Yes, yes. And then I move on to, well, Chris Candido had left and he had been down to Smoky Mountain, but I was there with Balls. Yeah. Um, so then I went with Balls down to Smoky Mountain, and there I'm around the Rock and Roll Express and <laughs> Tracy Smothers and the Dirty yeah. White Boy, all the Armstrongs, and if you can't <laughs> learn that locker room, that's a you problem. Yeah, amen. So each one of those guys, and, and, and I have Bull Bob Armstrong, pull you aside and go, hey, what do you think yeah. about this? And I'm looking at a guy who's literally got a PhD in this business, yeah. Yeah. and he's giving me advice. And then that segues to, okay, let's send you up to the Midwest to learn a little different style. Then go down to Puerto Rico to learn from Carlos Colon how to do the blood and guts. And oh, by the way, now it's time to go to the WWF, and there's Ron Simmons waiting for you to walk through the door. There you go. Yeah. And so, yes, I agree. Each part, each, like, there's those building blocks. And I'm glad you put, give me an analogy, because I never really thought about it like that, but there was, there was a plan. Yes. I just didn't know the plan right, until right. I lived the plan. Dumb as hell at the time. But. Yes, but then if you look back on it, each step brought me closer to where eventually I was going to go to allow me to rise by myself. Right. But you had to take those steps along the way. Yeah. Nobody could shortcut it. No, you can't short. You cannot short. You shortcut that. You're 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 a shooting star. You're here today, gone tomorrow. Total shoot question. Mm -hmm. Completely on the level. Yes. When Bob Armstrong talked that first time. He walked away and he goes, he talked to me. Because <laughs> I would have. <laughs> well, I'll give you one better. First time Bob Armstrong chopped me in the ring, I giggled. Because my 11 year old kid inside me went, Bullet Bob just chopped me. Fuck <laughs> yeah! yeah! Okay, yes. See, this, this does take, takes us in a completely different direction, but the same vein, I guess. You had grown up watching the business, loving the business, idolizing these guys mm -hmm. that you're now learning from and working with mm -hmm. in the dressing room. So you had a template. If, if, if somebody, one of the guys in the dressing room came out and said, hey, when Bob does his chop, you already understand what you're talking about because you've seen it. I've seen it, yes. Now you got it. Yep. Right? So you, you're able to put these pieces together and you understand. You may not know the exact language or what the purpose of the language is. Yes. But you get what they're saying to you at that moment. Yes, I had a grasp of the situation because I had seen it before a hundred times yeah. watching worldwide wrestling. Yeah. You know, wa watching um, you know wrestling on, on the Superstation. Right. So I had a grasp of what was going on. So when, when Bullet goes, I'll give you the chop, and then I'll give you the running chop. And you know, I already knew it. I knew how to. I knew how to take the bump. I knew how to yeah. sell it because I'd seen it. Yes. You know, and I think I think you can tell the difference, in my opinion. You can tell the difference between someone who grew up watching this mm -hmm. and 
didn't want to just be a star, but just wanted to be a wrestler. Yeah. As opposed to someone who gets in this and goes, I can make money in this. Right. You can see it in the way they work. You can see it and feel it in the attitude they have in a locker room. Yeah. And you can see it in how they work in companies and get along with people. Right, right. How many times have you run in the dressing room? At? And I always try to explain to people, because I, I mean, you guys have known me for a long time. I'm, this is the way I grew up. This is the way I live now. It's mm-hmm. my whole life. Uh, but I don't want or expect or need anybody to come blow smoke up my ass, mm-hmm. right? But if somebody comes and says, man, I, I, I remember this match we have with so-and-so and blah, blah. And you know then as they're talking about it that they didn't just go to the internet real quick and grab something mm-hmm. off. They, they, they felt that they were there with you. Yes. And then you hear people, I'm sure you guys have gotten the same thing a more, more, you know, million times. When a kid comes up and says, you're like an inspiration, like you're the reason I got into the business, like, you, like Ron was for mm-hmm. you, right? So when you hear those types of things, those are the things that make me sort of go, hmm, okay, something interesting. There's a little bit of me in this kid. Mm-hmm. A little bit of what we saw as the same kids. Were you as, again, these things pop in my eggs, I'm so fascinated to talk with you. Uh, when you first went on the road mm-hmm. and Bullet's talking to you, or any of these guys you're working with, did you go back to the hotel room feeling like the village idiot? Uh, yes, because, uh, and I'll use the analogy. Imagine being dropped in Japan. Yeah. You love Japan, but you can't speak Japanese. Right. And now, through immersion, you have to learn Japanese, and you have to learn it tomorrow. Yeah. But the whole time, you love Japan, and you yeah. love what's going on, so you're willing to do the work. Yes, I felt like the village idiot, but idiot, but I felt I needed to do the work because I wanted yeah. to be there. Yes. So you know what? If my job was to go learn Japanese in twelve hours, right. I would do it in ten. Yeah. I'm gonna go yeah. do it. Yeah. I'm gonna do it yeah. because when I come back tomorrow, I'm going to understand exactly what you're telling right. me. I'll never make mistake of, make mistake of not knowing what you're saying to me. So right. yes, I felt like that idiot, but I felt that was part of me doing the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You knew you had to pick it up. Yes, yes. And like my take on it was. My mom used to say, I mean, we were talking about our mothers earlier, and I'm mm-hmm. saying say LR, man. Love you, Louise. Uh, Love you, Barbara. That, uh, Love you, you know, when you're looking at wrestling, you know it, you're a fan, you get it. But then you get in the dressing room, you'd hear them either speak in Carney or, yeah. you know, you know, say, just follow my lead, kid, or the, the, the one I heard so many times and tattooed in my brain. Got to find a way to be different, kid, be different. Yeah, right. Yeah, what, like, what does be different mean? Right. We're all doing arm drags and yeah. body slams, and we're all wearing boots and t- how the hell do I have to cut my hair different? Do I paint my face? I mean, what do I do to be different? But all those little things that, as neophytes, I would say at that time, coming into the business, fans loved it. We had, we had the, the taste and the background for the texture of the business. Did, not a single one of us knew, does the body slam come before the suplex or after? Yeah. Uh, now here we are in the ring with these guys that have been in the business for 20, 30 years at that point, mm-hmm. some longer, uh, true legends. And you're getting a chance to work with them. It'd be like if you were in physics, in physics, we were getting a chance to work with Tesla and and, and Albert Einstein. Einstein, and, and we're and, we're first year students. Yeah, yeah, and they're your professors. Right? Yes, and, and, from. and they're willing to give you the knowledge. Amen. Yeah, they're willing to give you knowledge. All you have to do is listen. Amen. Yeah. It's not like they're holding the information back. Right. They're putting it out there. I remember hearing the first time hearing the Rock and Express with the gangsters put a match together. Right. God, God, R.I.P. New Jack. I love you, dog. Love you, New Jack, bro. Um, the first time here in the Rock Roast Rush put a match together, it was like they were speaking at a thousand miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. And making no sense because it was, hey, I'll do this, this, and I'll hit you the boom. Yeah, and then the third of them. And then the <laughs> what's a boom? Yeah. The, where is boom in the dictionary? Yeah, yeah. You know, what in the wrestling dictionary was boom. So then, but then, if you pay attention, and then I had, I use the term all the time now, I had the best seat in the house. Yeah. Sitting ringside, I got to, I got to hear the match put together. I got to go sit ringside, I got to watch the match up close. Yeah. So close I could hear what was going on. And then I got to go in the back and dissect the match after it was done. With those guys. With those yeah. guys. Dude. That's when it opened up and I'm opened up bumps. quickly because that's when you go, I know what a boom is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. get it because I got to hear it, see it, and then and then break it down and go, yeah. all right, tomorrow, why don't we try this at this place? Yeah. And this was really good. Let's keep that. Right. Do more of that, less of this. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. 
what my very similar experience. I was working my first, I can't remember if it was my very, very first thing, but my first like mini program as a green snot nose kid coming mm -hmm. into the UWF was with Pez. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Oh, what a, what a, I've heard nothing but good things. Phenomenal thing. talent, great guy. But we were working about the third or fourth day of the loop. Bring, he comes and says, God damn kids are killing me with those punches. And to this day, I don't know if he meant I was stiff or missing him by a mile. Right. You know? But Dominic never taught us to throw punches because he was that European style, the uppercuts. Uppercuts, yeah, yeah. So I, I told Pez, I said, I've never been taught. He, he looked at me like I, look, I was, had my head cut off, right? He went, follow me. Grab the, the light, line up for the night off the wall, walk into the shower, brick shower, tapes on the wall, and he goes, punch the paper. Mm -hmm. I looked at my wife, let's punch the paper. So I can't. He goes, why can't I? So I'll break my hand. He went, stop. Hit that, I mean, threw this beautiful punch and snap, crack. I never touched his fingers. I was yep. like, you just cut the lady in half, dude. Like, how'd you do that, you know? Every night he would take me in there and do And I honestly thought he was ripping me at first. So I'd be in there you know, looking to see if the boy's laughing at me. You know, like, is anybody paying attention? You know, and that's how I learned to throw a punch. Uh, but I, that's how they taught you, right? I was the same way. It was, it was go to a door jam. Something that if you hit it too hard, yeah. it hurt you back. Yeah. yeah. And then as you got better, it was a piece of paper hanging. Then it was a string. Yeah. And if you could pop it off and not move the string, yeah. now you were able to use it in a match. Yes, yeah. And so it was the same thing, and I would stand there for hours. And boom, who taught you that? Boom. That, that was uh, a oh. Robert, Robert Gibson. Okay, there you go. Yeah. And that was, that, was, that was hours of do this. This is what you need to do. Yep. And I would go back to, I would go back to the, we call it the Smoke Mountain Flop House. It was our little house we had in Morristown, Tennessee. And I, you know, I, was, I was going to do my homework. I was I was going back to the library. I was going yep. to the lab, yep. and I would stand there, and it was it was here and here, and then it was when I knew I got the snap on it. Now I needed my body to learn how to, how to move my body yep. to make it look. I just didn't need to. I didn't need an arm movement. I needed the whole wind up so that it was sure how to get this, how to get this, and then you know I felt like a proud puppy the first time I was in Knoxville Civic Coliseum, and I go it hurt. <laughs> yeah. And I almost was almost surprised the people when I yeah. hit that punch, you know. Yeah. But it was there. It was, yeah. and it was it was doing the homework, and it was it was listening to the lesson that was being put out there. Right, right. I mean, it really is a simple thing. We've had, this, uh, you know, we're talking before we came on the air. Me and Curtis Hughes and, and D'Lo, and three kids, roughly the same ballpark age group, right? Uh, complete different points in America, mm -hmm. growing up. But our, our stories are so, so similar. <laughs> His mom could have been my mom, my mom could have been Curtis's mom. Absolutely. It's the same people over and over again. Because they would react the exact same way <laughs> to the same situation. <laughs> Here, here's a big question. Steve Austin asked me this question. I had to think about it uh, when he said, how long were you in the business before you felt like you had control? Like, not that you mastered it, but, you, but if the match went off the rails, you knew you could sort of get it back fixed. The first time I ever felt comfortable grabbing control of a match, I was probably seven years in, and this is in the WWE now. Yeah, I'm in the WWE. Sure. Seven years in, I'm 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 on Raw every night. Yeah, um, and but that was now my teacher at that point is Ron Simmons, who's mm -hmm. breaking me down on a whole nother level. Right, and it wasn't until. You know, it wasn't, it was, a, it was, I think it was a match with Mark Henry where it went off the rails and I didn't have to think what to do, I just did. You just did it, right. I just, and, and I remember coming to the back going, I just called that in the ring. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, and I had had little bits of that wooden, but never where it was, you know, I've had calls in the ring where you have a, le a veteran right. leading and I, I'll throw something sure. in. Sure, yeah. That was the first time where, I was the veteran, yep. and it was. I had to fix it. I had, let's let's get this ship, yep. get the rudder right, and let's go. Yeah. And I remember feeling so proud of sure. that, like yep. so proud, and 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 that's when it was like, okay, this this is it's finally clicking. Yeah. And and that's I mean I was I'm lucky I was I'm very lucky in terms of not everybody gets this. I went from working you know at the wrestling school. To then Smoky Mountain Wrestling, where I'm working four days a week. Right. To Puerto Rico, where I'm wrestling five days a week. Where then I go to the WWE, where I'm wrestling, you know, 25 out of 30 days. Right, right. Like, 
not everybody gets that. No, no. And and that amount of reps, there's no there's no substitute for reps. That amount of reps gave yeah. me that confidence yeah. to do that. It's muscle memory, right? Yes, so, yes, absolutely right. Yeah, you're always saying now rhetorical question, I know the answer, but just so that anybody that's in the business or coming into the business thinks this through. So you, at about seven years, it was, by the way, the reason I smiled when you said that was, Steve said seven years, I said seven years. It's right <laughs> around that same time. That's a magical right? time, Yeah, right? where you sort of start to pick it up. And again, we were on the road 350, 60 yes, days, yes, yes. You know, 358 days a year back then, working with all future legends, right? Guys who are better than us. Yeah, way better. Guys who are way better than us. Now, rhetorical question. Did you learn anything after that seven years? That's when the learning started. Bingo, right? That's yeah. when, that's when, like literally, okay, I I tried to teach you now, it's just called the wrestling fog. Yeah. And so, with well, the wrestling fog is, I can only see from here to here. Yeah. And everything seen behind this is a mystery. Yeah. Well, at seven years, it went down, and it's like, the yeah. fog lifted, and yeah. it was like, oh my, I can see. I can see. Right. And that's when the learning started. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's... That's where you go, all right, I've gone to college. Right. I've gotten a master's degree. Yeah. Now I'm working on a PhD. PhD, right, exactly. Yeah. And that's where you, yeah. that's where, that's the make or break moment where either you become really good at this yeah. or you fade away. Right. So yeah, we started this conversation talking about how to break into wrestling and the things that you knew, didn't know, the background, that kind of thing. The village idiots that we were at that mm -hmm. time. And so you can see like my view of the wrestling business is how, you know, again, we've all had these incredibly identical ways. Different people, different faces, different cities, but almost the same exact same story mm -hmm. that seven years, seven years, seven years, you know, sort of have some control. I didn't feel a master in any way at mm -hmm. that point, but I knew that if, if Spock gets screwed up, I can get it back on track. Mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't going to go, oh my God, stop the match, I can't fix it. Uh, so now we're at, at the next point where, you know, it's one thing to know the, the moves, when to do them, when not to do them. So now we're building up that trajectory of the learning curve. But now, you, the, the big one is, now it's time, boom, D'Lo Brown, you're a lead star, draw uh, money. Yeah, that's the hard part. Yeah. That's that's another level of, it's like cuts in the NFL. Right. It's like making, you know, making the from the 93-man roster down to the 73-man roster, down yeah. to the 60-man roster. Fine, and when you finally, they put the confidence on you, finally made the 53-man roster, and you're on the team, yeah. and they believe in you. And that's the hard part, because that's where the pressure starts. Yeah. When you're no longer a project, yep. when you're, you're no longer a learning child, and when they go, all right, kid, we're going to give you an opportunity, give you a run, let's see what you can do with it. Yeah. And, and that's when you go, okay, okay. I've got all the tools. Did you freak out a little bit the first time? You get hyperventilate <laughs> a little bit. You get you, you tell me if I'm wrong. No, 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 no. You, you, like you don't you can't show it to anybody. Yeah. You, yeah. you share it with those who are the closest to you. Sure. I mean I shared it with, with, with Mark Henry or The Rock, but luckily I was around guys who were on the same path. Yeah. So we we're all sharing at the same time the same thing. Right. But you get the you get the you get the hyperventilation, you get the okay. And then you run through your mind, am I ready? Can I do this? Can I do yeah. this? And then the part of you that feels you're ready goes, you got this. Yeah. Okay? Just go do what you've learned how to do. Yeah. And that's not a smugness. No! It's, just, it, it's a self-confident thing where you say, okay, I've been taught properly. Mm -hmm. I've had the experience. If something screws up, I know how to get the kid back on track yes. or whatever. But now, you know, it's like to me, the biggest, once put it, like for me, it was a double whammy because I, when I went to ECW, I was put in a lead heel role. Mm -hmm. I'd been a babyface before, that white meat babyface, middle card. So now I'm thinking in my head, it's just opposite of being a babyface. So if I would just take a bump and sell here, I'll just be aggressive here. And, mm -hmm. and I, I found out really quickly it wasn't just it's that easy. It's not the same thing. <laughs> and luckily though, again, like one of those blocks just being put right in the perfect place. Here I come to ECW, here comes a 53-year-old Terry Funk, right? Shane, you're going to be angled with Terry, one of the greatest heels of our business, right? In the history of our business. And just like, like you said, sit at the learning tree and just soak it up. Right? Can, can I, uh, we have another similar bath. My first big win on WWF TV yeah. was Terry Funk doing the Chainsaw Charlie. Okay. And, yeah. and, and I remember him going, okay, kid, uh, we're going to go out there and have fun. You're going you're gonna to take the lead on this one. And I'm looking going, 
This is Terry Funk. <laughs> take the lead. NWA World <laughs> Champion Terry Funk is telling me to take the lead. Yeah. But then I took it as a challenge because I took it as a challenge where yeah. this is Terry Funk, NWA World Champion, yeah. and he's giving me the steering wheel. And you got to prove to him. And I got to prove him. Yes. I can control it. Yeah, yeah. And either halfway through this match, he's going to snatch the steering wheel away from me, yeah. or we're going to come to the back and he's going to go, good job, kid. Yep. And we came to the back. It was, good job, kid. And yeah. I went, yeah, yeah. Terry Funk just endorsed me. Yeah. First of all, he put me over. Yes. He, something he did not have to do. No, no. But he was willing to do that because he was trying to make the next. Right. Similar with you. He's trying to make the next sure. generation. Yes. Um, and he let me call it. And then we went to the back and he broke it down with me. Yeah. And it wasn't, okay, good. It was, here you go. Maybe you want to try doing this. Maybe you want to try doing yeah. this. And it was it was one of those moments. It was an aha, eye popping moment. Yeah. And there, I say, it, confidence is contagious. Once you start getting it, yeah. it grows. And not an egotistical no, way. No, no, once no. Once that confidence, once you get it, and it starts to grow, and so you feel start feeling more comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. And that is contagious. That's a good thing for a professional wrestler. Absolutely. Because what separates those, and I say it all the time, that that opening match guy from Stone Cold is belief in yourself, yeah. confidence in your character, yeah. confidence in your ability to call a match, and confidence in your abilities. Right, right. And once you have that, yeah. boom. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. It, it, again, like I, I always know where, I, where the conversations are going, because again, Curtis's story is the same as your story, mm -hmm. same as Rhino's story, same as everybody's story. There might be a little nip tuck over here, a few things there, different cities, different mm -hmm. names, whatever. But it really is like behind the music, right? Mm -hmm. Here's this great group that they hit it big, they starve, they hit it big, they're making millions of dollars, and they break up, they hate each other, they, they, drugs get involved. But it's yeah. the same story over and over, same thing in our business uh, with Terry Funk, the first time I with Terry. Now he's 53, I hadn't seen him in a couple of years at that point. And Paul wants us to do a 45 minute Broadway. Mm -hmm. With Funk, okay. I wasn't sure I could do it. I've right. never gone that long. And uh, made a singles, and Terry comes walking in the back. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, I can barely get the stairs. I went to Paul said, can he even wrestle tonight? Okay, he looks so crippled up, right? And so you know, going through the day, and he sees like he's loosened up a little bit, he's still hobbled around. We get that bell, ding, ding, ding. Right? I was ready to scream for Louise, right? <laughs> Come save my life, Louise. But the whole time, you know, you've worked with so you get this. You know, we're in the ring, and, you know, Throwing punches back and forth, and he stops and he goes, "You punch like a fucking yes, yes, yes." I'm going, "Is he working? Is he shooting? I can't quite tell, you know." So, he tell, you know, later the next one, a little bit more stomach, like tater, you know. And he keeps going, on, keeps going. On. Finally, I hit him with half a tater, right? Mm -hmm. Come on, man, you put fucking girl in there. Now I'm giving party 70, 75 percent tater. Mm -hmm. That's it, kid. Come on, come on, come on, right? Mm -hmm. and I was like, yes. Either he's crazy or whatever, you know. But years later, I, I called you. Know, you remember I used to have a bad temper, mm -hmm. and uh, so I call. You know, call me. I was raging about something, right? And I call fucking this, and I kept saying, "How the fuck have you put up with this shit for this long?" And blah, 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 blah. So we, uh, his answering took me about took him about forty five minutes, right? And it would be a long. Oh, goddamn, Dino, I'll tell you. <laughs> And he's going on, and he kept saying, hey, look, do you hear me, boy? Are you listening? And I'd say, yeah, Terry, I'm listening to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, God damn, <laughs> I'll tell you, it's so crazy. And this went on for 45 minutes, and he is, what? How did you know I'm going crazy? And he goes, and last, about 40 minutes in, like the 20th time, he said, Shane, are you listening to me? boy? I said, yeah, Terry, I'm listening. What? He goes, God damn, Shane, the only way to make it in this business is going to be crazy. <laughs> God damn, you're crazy. you got to be crazy like a fox. You know what I'm talking about? And he went right back in the gimmick. I was at my house, and I went, that's all a gimmick? Yep. I was floored. I thought, what a brilliant thing. Yep. You know, so, and now I can see, right? I was I boom. <laughs> boom. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Um, Terry was so cool because uh, he went to a different place when he worked. Yes. Oh, yes. He went to a whole, and it was, yes. a, it was a depth of character I had never seen before. Yeah. And very few mastered. Mm -hmm. So, it was like a master class on immersion in your gimmick and yeah. in your character. Yeah. And yes, the crazy like a fox line is something I've heard. Boy, it was it floored me because I'd known Terry at that point. It was 93. 
I had known him for at least 13, 14, 15 years. Not real close with him mm -hmm. or anything, but been around him and everything. I just always thought that, how oh, that David, how you doing? I just always thought that was him. That was him. Like, that's the, and this one, like the setup went on for literally for like 45 minutes. And I was like, you're right, God damn, say it, Terry. And, you're going to be crazy, God damn, you're going to be crazy like a fox. And I remember my, like, it just, like, what, like, like the lights went on. I was like, what the hell? But, uh, I'm curious. So you, you, and how, how many years before you were in the WWE from uh, break in? Luckily, I I broke in in '94. I was in WWE uh, January of '97. So three three years. years. Yeah. Wow. So now, I mean, that's got to be intimidating, right? It was. I, I mean, I went from one. Okay, and, and once again, I never got in this business to be famous. Right. Right. I thought I would. Larry Sharp's Monster Factory is where I would be. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then one thing led to another. I was in Smokey. One thing led to another. I was in Puerto Rico. And one thing led to another. And I'm, I'm on Shotgun Saturday Night. So it just steamrolled. So yes, when I'm standing there looking, I look in the locker room and there's Bret Hart. Yeah. And there's Shawn Michaels. <laughs> there's Ron Simmons. Mm -hmm. There's Triple H. There's a, you know, I'm like, do I belong here? Like, right? How did I get here? I'm, I'm a fat kid from New Jersey, <laughs> and three years ago, I was taking a, my first official professional bump. Yeah, yeah. But yes, it's you feel like you're in the middle of the ocean with no dinghy, no life raft, no boat, no nothing. Sure. Um, and but it, it forces you to either swim with the sharks or drown. Yeah. And you have you make a choice. Yeah, yeah. You gotta make a choice. See, the thing for me, you know, I've been. At that stage, I was still paying attention to the business, but busy on the road and having a young baby and everything. Mm -hmm. Wasn't paying super close to like, like I used to as a kid, right? The way I would just mm -hmm. and just like digest everything. But the thing, first of all, I knew Ron from UWF, right? <laughs> like you guys hear this out there all the time. You ain't gonna find a sweeter human being than Ron Simmons. So no. I mean, just a phenomenal guy. No. So you know, I'd known him for all those years. But the thing that bled through to me anytime I saw Nation of Domination on camera was didn't matter what the storyline or whatever the WWE had riddled in there. It came across as legitimate. Mm -hmm. There was a you didn't sit there and think, okay, these are three kids from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania trying to be Nation of Islam or right, Nation right. or whatever, you know. Uh, something I couldn't possibly play. But that legitimacy in my estimation, I'm, I'm curious to get your take, is today it's it's not just waned, it's gone today. Mm -hmm. There's no matter of hey doesn't matter if this looks real or not. So I'll shoot you in the head, and then two seconds later, you're back flipping and flying yeah. over God's creation. Now, what's your take on that? On all of that? Um, it, it feels like like we weren't okay. I know we weren't acting a scene out. We were in our minds legitimately having yeah. a fight. Yeah. Where a lot of the time today, it feels like the people are just fighting out a scene. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a video game in a lot of instances. Uh, and, I, and this is not a broad stroke because there, right. there are swaths of this business and sure. I, I will throw Impact Wrestling in there where it's, we try to maintain that, yeah. that realism. But there are, there are parts of the business where it's, there's no different than the video game that I'll play, you know, later on tonight. Yeah. And it's just move, 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 move and it's, there's no register, sell, suspense, drama. Yeah. I, are you, I, again, rhetorical, because I'm sure I know your answer, but uh, are you as taken back as I am at the athleticism of these kids? Now, and once again, as much as I go, this is over here, the ability for these kids to live above the top rope, yeah. the things they can do, the way they can move their bodies, it's I, in, not in my wildest dreams yeah. could I ever imagine <laughs> doing things like that. I mean. You've got a guy like Ricochet at WWE who's literally an X-Men come to life. Yeah. You know, the way he can flip and fly and land in that Superman sure. pose. Yeah. Or, you know, um, just just the level of athleticism they have. And it's, it's like, I considered myself athletic yeah. until I was around someone who was more athletic than right, me. Right, right. And so today's athlete, today's wrestler, they have a lot of advantages over us in terms of... Yeah. Um, athleticism and skill and, and proficiency at wrestling and and once again I've used the term before I want to sound like old men get off my lawn <laughs> but I think the one thing we had in our day was I can't convince you wrestling is real 
but I can convince you that I'm real. Right, right. And I think that's something that we as elders mm -hmm. need to give back to this generation right. to help them move forward. Because I think there's that's the the one disconnect that we're having is, yes, I love the athleticism and let's use it. Now you work with a lot, a lot of kids a lot more closely than I do because yes. I'm more outside the business. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. As I'm looking in and watching, it seems that I see, and I'm, I don't mean to make this as an accusation of being disrespectful or anything. Again, I was like, did you open your mouth when you walked into your first dressing room? How long before you did? <laughs> I was in the WWE before I even started. So <laughs> right. It was the way we were taught. Yeah, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was keep your ears open, yep. keep your eyes open, keep your mouth shut. Yeah, eyes and ears open and mouth shut. And then you don't have an opinion until someone asks for it. Yeah, yeah. And then when someone asks for your opinion, you better have plan A and plan B. Right. Now, see, the reason I ask that is, again, not to point this out because of these kids are being disrespectful. I don't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. When you walked into your dress rooms, and I walked into my dress rooms, there was young snot those kids that mm -hmm. knew nothing. We were sitting in rooms with like these larger than life guys that had successfully proven they could do it and mm -hmm. draw money for decades. Yes. So I, the one thing my mom used to say again, Louise, back to Louise, right? That the smartest guy in the room is the guy who knows what he doesn't know. Yes. I knew I didn't know professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can do a bump and I can do this move and that move. I don't know the business. And that guy does, that guy does, mm -hmm. that lady does. So shut up, pay attention. Uh, so, I, but, but again, we had the luxury, the blessing of sitting in dressing rooms with men and women that had mm -hmm. been around the business. Today, do you see it that that's largely been sanitized out? Um, yeah, because we don't have the territories. We don't have the three-hour car rides with the vet. We don't yeah. have that, that yeah. bonding moment where yeah. I'll take a liking to you, so I'm going to impart knowledge on you. Sure. I got lucky because I got put in Ron Simmons' back pocket. Yeah. So that was my riding buddy. That was my that was my agent. That was my critiquer. So yeah. you know we would we would hit up the Seven Eleven, buy some drinks for the ride. Sure. I would drive, and if it were a four hour ride, Ron would break me down it for two hours, hard. and and he would break he would break me down for two hours, and he'd build me up for two hours. We would get to the hotel, and he goes, "We'll do it again tomorrow." Yeah. And rinse and repeat, do it again. Yeah. And I got lucky with that. Yeah, sure. And that's not a that's not a common occurrence anymore. Right. Now, I'm, I'm, I've heard through the grapevine, and please, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, to full disclosure, I've been sat in a dressing room with kids in the business and, and any of the major promotions for, for years and years. Mm -hmm. But I'm hearing through the grapevine through different people that Adilo Brown or Shane Douglas is sitting there watching the monitor visiting that night, and not a single kid in that dressing room came to ask you or me a question. Now, I can only speak for our locker room and Impact is the only locker room I'm in. Mm -hmm. And if I'm, we have a monitor that's in the huge locker room where um, 99, if, I would say 80% of the talent are sitting around watching. If they're not watching, they're getting ready to go to the ring. Mm -hmm. And if I'm sitting down and I'm not aging a match, I will have talent come sit next to me. Yeah. And I will get, what do you think of what they just did? And I'll, they'll allow me to break it down. Okay, so good. I know from my locker room, um, there are guys like myself and 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 Devari and 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 Scott Demore, guys like that, who are willing to give the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we have a locker room that's willing to listen, Good. and not only just listen, but to ask the tough questions right. to get to the answer. Right. I mean, they remind me a lot of who I would have liked to have been because we weren't allowed to ask those questions. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, I will sit right in the middle on purpose. I'll sit right by the monitor. Yeah. And 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 see what happens. And before I know it, I've got. Trey Miguel here. I've got, you know, uh, Josh Alexander here. I've got an Eddie Edwards sitting over here who, who knows as much as I do. Yeah. But then he'll go, hey, bro, what do you think of this? And then we'll sit and talk. And as we're talking here, you notice the other talent who are around are listening. Right. So they're learning from good. them too. Good, good, good. So, yeah, that I can only speak for our locker room. Yeah. That's that's the kind of locker room we have. Because I'm watching, when I watch the kids before, again, I am literally like this. Yeah. When you watch these kids do this, you're like, Phew. I thought I was not, let me preface this before I say it, in no way comparing myself to guys like Bruno or Dominic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I knew that my generation was way more athletic than those guys were. Mm -hmm. You know, they drew a gazillion times Time more, more money, money, yes. But, like, just what he could do, what I could do, I saw a difference. The world, different place, and all those things, that, you know, the, those X factors. But 
there was never a time, even though I, I thought my generation was more athletic, that I thought there's nothing those guys can teach me. I knew that, again, I didn't know squat. Mm -hmm. So to, the first time I met Bruno, came to Dominic's school, and, he, and I was a kid growing up in Pittsburgh. My dad wouldn't take me to the movie theaters, wouldn't go to a, a, a amusement park because of crowd, he was World War II vet, didn't want to be around crowds mm -hmm. of people. But he'd happily go sit in that civic ring and watch wrestling. He loved it that much. So, you know, me as a kid, I'm watching the ring. I'm also watching the entranceway mm -hmm. because you'd see, you know, crazy Luke Graham and you'd see Dominic and you'd see Strongbow. And Never one time in all the years as a kid going that I ever see Bruno stick his head out of there. So as a kid, I'm thinking, well, he's champion. He must have his own monitor in his own dressing room. So the first day I met Bruno, uh, I said, hey, you know, I'm uh, curious. Bruno, I watch all the time, big fan, blah, blah, blah. And I said, but I never saw you. I said, Were, weren't you interested in watching the match? Well, first I asked him, I said, did you have your own locker room with a monitor? And he said, no, I dress with the, with the boys. And I said, weren't you interested in watching the matches? I never saw you one time ever stick your head out there. He goes, no. And then he imparted my first wrestling lesson on drawing money, right? He said, remember, kid, the fans will pay to see you one time. Now, today we turn on, we'll just say WWE is the largest, right? And you'll see D'Lo or Shane Douglas or whoever in segment one, segment three, segment seven, eight, nine. And so, like, each time you come out using that Bruno analogy, there's a little bit less rub there because we've already seen you. We love you, mm -hmm. but we've already seen you. And so, like, you see the business. We talked about this a little bit at dinner in full disclosure, so we'll talk about it now on camera. When you watch, for lack of better phraseology, when I was in WCW competing against the WWE, mm -hmm. it was rare, but there were those nights where everything would click and you'd think, okay, we're getting a grasp to close that gap. Mm -hmm. And then you turn on the replay of Raw and go, you felt like the Roadrunner chasing the, or I mean the, the Coyote chasing the Roadrunner, right? Beep, beep. Oh, yeah. Just, it was incredible. When I turn that show on now, I, my son likes to watch with Dominic and I because he wants us to point out to him what we think is right or wrong. And when I watch it now, I don't see any of the Vince McMahon or the team at that time that created that compelling footage. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see any of that sense of urgency. Like, you know, the, the stories are now, right? 30 minutes before the taping, Vince tears up the TV thing, do it again, after they've been working all week. Do you, because you've worked for a lot longer, a lot more successfully than I did, mm -hmm. what's your take on this? Um, it, it's, it's a hard thing, because, you know, I've seen the product, and I, I, I know, I see the ratings numbers, and. You know, you hear about some of the choices that are made or decisions yeah. that are made, and it's just, I can only speak on the fact that it's a far different place than I, when I was there. Yeah. Um, whether it's better or worse, I don't know. Worse is easy to say because you can look at the numbers. Right. Um, I, I just, I don't know where it went off the rails, but I'll capitalize on saying this, by it going off the rails like it is, it's leaving a huge gap opportunity for opportunities the key word it's the greatest word in this business um, it's leaving a huge opportunity for other companies to step up yeah and given given that chance to become something right and that's opening the door for you know impact AEW sure. um, you know whoever to maybe pull away a few fans yeah and, and bring them over to our product yeah, and then show them what we're going to provide. But it's um, it's it's a it's a far cry from where um, it once was. Now, when you were there, they were really humming on all eight cylinders. Yes, right? I mean, yes. They were wham bam and thank you, man. Yeah. Uh, explain what what you would see like in an average television. I mean, you know, I, I I know, John, but I want the fans to understand what did D'Lo Brown? You get the TV, you're walking in when this company's chugging. Um, what, what 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 was Nation of Domination? What was D'Lo Brown's role? How how easily plugged in, moved around? What p p pros and cons? So you you typically get we would be at uh, we'd go out on the road on Friday. So typically I'd get a creative call on Thursday, kind okay. of get your mind in this kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. Here's yeah. where we're going for what TV on Monday. Right. TV on Tuesday, so kind of start thinking good four or five days. Yeah, day. start thinking about this. Well, you know, and I was given a little snippet of what I would be doing. Ron was given the big heavy load. Sure. Obviously, being the top dog, he was given right. the heavy load. 
and then we would get with the boys on Friday and you know you'd maybe have a match on Monday on Raw so you'd go to the house show and you'd do a dry run of that match yeah. um, and that's when we the nation would get together and go okay this was given to me this was given to me and we'd compare notes and kind of get on a similar page right and this would all give us a, a straight thought of sure. where we're going to on Monday um, Monday you walk in um, good catering everybody's got a top side <laughs> of catering right because that's the that's the community that's that's the cheers that's the bar of everybody yeah. catering is where everybody gathers shoot the shit shoot the shit yeah. and then boom by the time you're done catering the board's up yeah go see the board okay deal versus x-pac uh european title okay let's go get final creative on this so right. go you know either you go see got your agent will see got you or you see your agent because it's it's you, your opponent, referee, agent. So either you go find your agent or you go find you. You get final creative there. And then from there, you kind of figure out, okay, here's how we're going to approach tonight's match based on the information that we're given on Thursday, based on the talk we had on Friday, based on the matches we went through. Because normally we do, if it was a Thursday or a Friday, Saturday house show, it'd be Friday, I'm over. Saturday, sure. he's over. Yeah. And we have both options both for options, right? Monday. Yeah. And then you kind of figure out how it fits into the, new, the story and how it fits in the whole collective of what's going on mm -hmm. and how further how to further the story so that you go out there and you, you put your match together based on that. Right. And then, okay, here's the finish. Okay, and now what's it leading to next? What's it leading to next week? Where are we going? Okay, got it. Here's what we're doing. Let's go. You have to look at bigger picture. Don't look at just tonight. Right. A winner or loss tonight means nothing because you can lose a battle but win the war. Sure. So you look at tonight. Okay, I'm putting next block overnight. He's taking the European title. But in two weeks at the pay-per-view, I'm going to snatch it back. Right. Boom. Let's do this. So I'm curious. Did Vince share that far in advance? Did he say to you like at that time? I would get like Vince Russo would share with me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, or it was Vince Russo a lot during Attitude. And then once Russo left, you'd get various creative guys who would come up to you and share that information with you. Right. So you had a good idea of where it was going. And that was important. We would have a sure. grasp of where we, where we are, where we're going, and then you'd have leading in maybe to next Raw. Or if we were close enough to pay-per-view, you would know your match pay-per-view and right. here's what we're thinking about going to. Yeah. Now, things are something that could change. Sure. But here's the... Here's the, the, the flowing idea. Right. Now I'm curious. You get the television, Creative's already called you to lay this stuff out to you, giving you a general overview of where it possibly, probably going. Uh, you get the TV that night, something's changed up, or there's something about what you guys have been given that you didn't like. Mm -hmm. uh, was there an open door to go to Vince and say, Vince, uh, we think this or that? Not that he just say, okay, great, do it your way, but that you had the opportunity to at least voice your professional concerns on where this was supposed to go. Okay, now, there's, this is a twofold question. For me, I could voice to my agent, my, my agent would take it to Vince. Right. For guys like Ron, yeah. Ron would go right to Vince because sure. he had earned that right. Right. Um, most of the time, and in my early learning, Ron would tell me what my complaint is and he would take it with, for me to Vince. Yeah, yeah. Because Ron would see problems because he, he's, he's been up and down this river sure. a little, a little <laughs> times. Yeah. He could see the rapids coming, so he would, he would go, you know, we need, to do, we, we need to do this. This is a little different here. We need to try to fix this out. Okay, I'll be right back. Right. Okay? And then if it got deep enough where then Vince wanted to hear my, my take on it because Vince is big on tell me why. Right. So if it, were, if it were a situation where it was a problem, if I took it to my agent, I would go to Russo. I would, and usually for me, it was stop at Russo, but then if it had to, Ron would take me to Vince and then talk to Vince and Vince would go, okay, let's, let's, let's figure this out. And then Vince would give you his idea. Here's what I have for this. Right. Here's what I'm thinking. Go. And you had about five seconds to give your argument. Yeah. And if you did not articulate the right way, then you're going with Vince's idea. Yeah. But you had about five or ten seconds to kind of sway him. Try to sway him yeah. to get his and. You know, I never really had to go there that much. It was more me watch, walking with Ron, listening to Ron, because Ron would go in there and go, no, nah, man, we got to do this different right. way to go, you know. Um, normally, I would stop, my argument stopped with the agent and or Russo. Okay. Now, uh, Ron obviously had, had 
aside from the fact that he's such a great guy and, and, and so amiable, easy mm -hmm. to be around. But a guy like Ron also carried with him the gravitas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, having been you know, a football player and so successful at that, and then coming into wrestling, he was so great with that. And had forged a relationship with Vince over the years. So my mm -hmm. question would be, like you said, it was different for you than say Ron, which makes perfect sense. But if Joe Blow in the bottom slot of the company had an issue, if he went to his agent or whatever, how open were those doors to, or was it just, do we told you to do? Um, you could you could voice your opinion to your agent, mm -hmm. and you'd have a chance to try to sway your agent. Yeah. And if your your argument was compelling enough, your agent would go, let me run this flag point. Mm -hmm. If you didn't make a compelling argument, it was, you need to go do this. Okay. But, see, to me, like, I, in the brief time that I was there in 95, I saw very little bit. The one reason I always chuckled about it was the last time that I was up there, there was something that was making me hesitate on signing the contract. Mm -hmm. And I think it was six trips it took me up, up there. Not that I was trying to string along or anything, I just couldn't make up my mind. I was very happy in ECW and had no reason to want to leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last meeting, Vince said to me, hold on, a, you know, a little note, Patty. That's my personal cell phone. I don't care if it's the middle of the night, you have any questions, call me immediately. So when I saw the Dean Douglas outfit, which was pitched to me as a college professor, black and gold and mm -hmm. you know, the whole deal, and uh, I saw that outfit, and I'm like, like, that's not quite what we're talking about. So I called Vince, not in the middle of the night, but I called him for the day, right? He listened uh, very professionally, and then he said, that's the way I like it. And that was the end of it. So mm -hmm. I, can, I can voice my opinion, but, uh, and, and look, my opinion was, you know, I wanted to sign up, up there based on what was pitched to me. But to me, if I'm, I don't care how, if I've been in the business for 90 years, if somebody like you or somebody that has drawn money and proven themselves over, not just a flash in the pan, mm -hmm. over a period of time, I want to hear that. I may not agree with it. I may never agree, agree with it. Mm -hmm. But I want to hear what's, what's going through those wheels in your head because if you've been successful at that that long, then it's, that ain't by chance or luck. Mm -hmm. So... Again, I might say I appreciate that, but, and go to something else, but to just systemically to say, not doing it because it's your idea, not my idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there were those opportunities for the for majority of the people there. There was an open dialogue. It yep. wasn't just do what I tell you. Yeah. Because we're not, we, we're never just robots, and you want to have that creative. Sure that creative thought process inside of your talent. Yeah. If you don't have it, then you have the wrong talent. Yeah. So you want to hear, and, and, and you know, let's fast forward now to me being an agent right. and producer. I don't want to just give you, here's A, B, C, and D, but right. do it. Yeah. If you have, look, there's no right answer. No one has the right. right answer. So if I give you this that comes from creative, yeah. and I give it to you, and you go, hey, what about this? And then I go, oh, wow, think about it. You know what? That's a great idea. Yeah. Hold on, let me run that. Let me go run a flagpole, and then yeah. I'll go take it back. So yeah. you want your talent to have that that um, that creative juices flowing. Yeah. And if they had that creative juices flowing in the back, then they can have that creative juices flowing in the ring. They'll have that creative juices flowing when it comes to character, and that's how a character grows. I mean, you look at a guy like Austin. None of that was given to him. Right. None of that was given to him. That was all him. Yes. And then. The idea was laid down, the foundation was laid down, and then the office ran with it. Right. But the building blocks came from inside of one person's head. After the ringmaster. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, the, the 64, I guess we'll use trillion dollar question. Yeah, right? yes. Because trillion, trillions around so easy. Ever in your career use a teleprompter? Never. Oh, only, you know when I used teleprompter? When we had to do liners for shows like... Uh, Hi, this is Dilo Brown. We're coming. This is Sky Sports One. Listen on, you know, whatever. Chicago, so, yeah, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just re just lines you're reading for uh, various market reads. Yeah. But I, never a promo or anything like that. Right. I'll ask the question just for the sake of asking it, because I feel like an idiot doing it. I know the answer. Uh, did Ron Simmons ever use a teleprompter? <laughs> right. Everything Ron said came from my yeah. Ron. Now look, there, there, see guys, I've got this, I'm sure, I don't want the words in your mouth, but I'm sure you guys fought out in the same place. I have a huge, huge chip about this teleprompter stuff mm -hmm. because my feeling is if you take 10 wrestlers and say, learn to do a promo, 
two or three of them, maybe four, will suck at it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll put them with a manager or not have them talk. Two or three might be okay, can get through it, do a decent one. Mm -hmm. But you might get one or two that in time can create magic. Can go. Yeah. yeah. And to me, when you do that, you negate that when you say, okay, deal. Boom. Here's here's your script. Read it. Uh, the other part of it is, on the, which I think is another thing lacking, and what I'm watching in these bigger companies like AEW and WWE, is the absolute lack of character development. So, you, you know, if you go back and look at, now, I guess the, the best way to explain this is to give you a quick little story. Uh, in 87, 88-ish, right on there, mm -hmm. we're in, uh, doing TV at Gainesville, WC, I guess it was NWA at that time, probably just on the cusp of turning. But uh, Dustin told me, TV, your, your signals push is going to start this week on TV. So I'm thinking, who am I going to beat on TV this week? Like, who am I going over on, you know? We get there and they call me and I look on the mark. Shane Douglas versus Arn, or, yeah, Shane Douglas versus Arn Anderson. I'm like, I'm Ooh, over on Arn Anderson? Yeah, like, holy big, shit. Yeah, that's big. So <clears throat> we get called down to Dusty's office and Dusty starts laying his match out. Double A, baby, you keep going to work on that kid's arm and you sell your ass off Shane Douglas and referee, you get the ropes, referee will break it and darn, you get back on that. And this is going on for like 10, 15 minutes and I'm just selling and not, you know, well, and at the end he goes, so that, that didn't change. You refuse to go up and Tommy, you ring the bell. So I'm getting my ass kicked for 15 minutes, but I don't give up. And how's that my push? Young and dumb, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'll go, like when I, I remember specifically when wrestling Taz, or when I wrestle somebody today who's got a, a, a submission uh, finish, you'll hear one or two voices in the audience say, Shane Douglas won't ever tap, right? Because they remember from way back when that kid that didn't know anything wouldn't give up to Arn Anderson. Mm -hmm. yeah. Didn't know, again, shit from, from a hole in the ground at the time. And thinking like, that's my push, what the hell, Dusty? And those little things that I'm sure you have in your career, we all have in our career, mm -hmm. some little seed planted 30 years ago or more, and the fans go, no, 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 they ain't gonna do that because I remember from way back when, that kind of level of character development yes. that I think is lacking today, what's your take? And that's a good, that's a good thought there because um, a push isn't just a win right. or a promo, a push is the beginning of a character trait. Push is the beginning of you gaining confidence as an individual. You right. know, um, you would have back in the day, you'd get a thing where um, young upstart white and bay face is going to challenge this guy, and maybe he he, he lays him out, boom boom. All yeah. right, just holds the ring. Right. Well, the next week he'll goes, you know what? Who do you think you are? I can beat you in ten minutes, or I can beat you twice ten minutes. Right. Well, maybe he gets the one win fall on you, then you know. But it can't beat you in ten minutes. So technically, you won, right? Right, right. And then, then two weeks later, he goes, "You know what? I'll beat you in five minutes." And somehow, you get the win in four and a half minutes. Yeah. yeah. That's the beginning of a character trait. You're yes. slowly building a push where you go from never winning to all of a sudden I'm a champ. Yeah. Is failed from the start because there's no substance to it. Right. You have to build. Every person has character. Every person has gone through things in their life that give them right. and make them who you are. Sure. Our characters in TV have to be the same way yeah. so they can relate to it. So you have to take those incremental steps up. Right. So in those promos we talked about, you're voicing that character out. They're not giving you a script for it. So you're talking to this character, Lilo Brown, mm -hmm. the franchise, Curtis Hughes, whoever. Uh, so now we can be at a bar and I can say, hey, man, what would Lilo Brown, your character, how would he vote? Mm -hmm. what, would he help that old lady across the street with a mm -hmm. can or would he kick her cane out? Whatever those questions, well, you could answer those questions. We have to go, uh, let me get back to you. Vince Russo, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to ask this question because you understand the character because you voice that character out. Mm -hmm. I think with these teleprompters today, aside from the obvious stuff, the, 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 the intensity of the character, the explanation of the character, what makes this character tick, is not knowing those, uh, those little nuanceable things. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy's got a temper. This guy's really chill. Uh, whatever it's going to be that that you sort of get that, that to me was the fun part of voicing the character was mm -hmm. I'm going to plant this little seed and see where it goes. Uh, that made it sort of the cat and mouse game for me. Uh, but with the teleprompters, I just see the, the again these kids with that jaw dropping athleticism being told to read teleprompters, and they come to the ring and there's there's not that feeling. Really the, the example I was given I use Brian Pillman. 
and I tell kids when I'm training at the center here or uh, you know on the road, turn Brian Pillman, pick out whatever whatever match, whatever segment, partner, whatever, watch it. Start watching and try to take your eyes off of it. You can't. Can't. Macho man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, same could thing. rip your eyes off of it. All these greats that you and I had the pleasure of knowing and working with, mm -hmm. you'd watch them in the ring and literally, physically could not pull yourself away from watching them because you didn't know what was going to happen next. Mm -hmm. What's your feeling? Do you feel that that has gone out of the business? If so, what's your feeling on it being out of the business? Well, and I think it goes to the greats blur the line between the person they are and the character they are, and you don't know the difference. Right. Um, use Brian Pillman. You didn't know where the work started and Brian started. Right. Okay, so those greats blurred the line so much you wanted to see what was going to happen next. Yeah. Savage, you wanted to see what happened next. Hogan, Rock, Austin, sure. you wanted to see because the line was gone between like, here's a dude I know in the locker room. They didn't do it out there, but they're still the same person and right. they're still cool. Right, right. So like, that's what I want to aspire to be. Yeah. You know, and, and I think once again, I'll, I'll speak on on my locker room. We don't use we don't use teleprompters. I give, you know, creator will give our kids bullet points: mm -hmm. who, what, when, and where. Yeah. Now, go say in your own words because only you know you. Yes. Yeah. I don't know you as well as you know you. Right. But Eddie Edwards, you know you better than me. Sure. So, here's your promo for your segment. Here's a situation. I can give you a situation. Here's your here's your bullet points. Right. I need three minutes to talk and go. Perfect. And put you out there and, and go fail. Yeah. Go fail a thousand times. That's right, yeah. Fail every day. Just don't make the same mistake two days in a row. Absolutely. And, and and that's slowly but surely, that's how we're approaching this business, the way it was taught to us. Good. Um, and, and we're laying down the blueprints to give these kids the ability to go out there and, and look, because not every promo goes right. Right. And just think, you know, what if I've got this, this teleprompter here and it tells me to say, you know, on Sunday, I'm wrestling Steve Austin. Yeah. And The Rock walks to the ring. Yeah. And you go, on Sunday. <laughs> right, right, right. So now you can't, someone can't think if you give them the answers to the test. Right. But, if you, to. but if you give the problem and then you show them how to work the formula out. Yeah. They can talk to anybody, anytime, yeah. about anything. Yeah. And that's how we approach it, where it's, here's your bullet points. This is what you do. Why do you suppose then, like, WWE res, 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 rely, relies on those teleprompters so exclusively, then? Is it, it like, a, is I, a time-saving thing? Is it... You know, I don't, I don't know if the answer is if it's a time-saving thing, or it's a control thing, or it's a fear of them making a mistake thing. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it wasn't something that we used when I was there. Um, it, it, I don't know. I couldn't give you the answer. Um, I wish we would go back to allow guys to make mistakes. If 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 a guy didn't learn from his mistakes, there'd be no Barack. <laughs> okay, right, yeah. because he would make a mistake in every promo and fix it and never make the mistake again. Yeah, yeah. there'd be no Austin because he made mistakes in every promo before he became. And that's the bottom line, right? You know, so, um, and that's how they got comfortable in their own skin with who they were, right? And you can ask guys like The Rock or Steve Austin, hey, what was The Rock like when he was 18 years old and just coming up? And there was a backstory in his yep. head of what yes. that that character mm -hmm. was at 18, right? Not oh, I don't know. It was me, and then I became him when I started wrestling at 28, right? Right. It was hey, The Rock was. A, Badass in college, sure. Like, you know, I played ball and you know whatever, and I, I was the most electrifying man in the yeah. University of Miami. You know, now a guy that can do that mm -hmm. uh, can clearly, if he can off the cuff give you a backstory that's fictional mm -hmm. that, that easily. My guess is on camera, he's going to create some magic because if he can make you believe that mm -hmm. that made up contrite story. He sure as hell is going to be able to make you believe whatever angle it is that he's going to be portraying yes. this or she. Yes. Uh, it's, I mean, we can go on and on with this. I, I, I'd love to have you back on. I, I, I would love to do I love this. I'm enjoying this. But you know, the, these are the things that still, after all these years, fascinate me about wrestling. 
because there, again, there's so many avenues in and a gazillion ways that our trajectories go. You and I were together this long and I hadn't seen each other for what, seven, eight years? Yes. Uh, you know, but when you sit down and listen to these stories, right, everybody I have in the seat talking and you go, man, that sounds like this or that sounds like Dilo last week. Right? It's the same story over mm -hmm. and over again, but I, I love hearing because I have such an affinity for, for our sport. It's a little question that popped in my head. When did Mark become a negative term? Where does See, that take on? It, 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 to me, and it went from being an acknowledgement of who's considered a fan to a derogatory term in terms yeah. of you mark like yeah. you shouldn't be around here. And I, I don't know when or how that became a term like that. Um, I know at, at, at my school we don't, we don't use the word mark. Right. Because I think it's, it's derogatory. It's insulting. Mm. Um, to call someone who appreciates this, yes. like I don't, want, I don't want to demean the fans who pay their hard-earned money to come see me. Amen. Um, I want to to lift them up. Do I call them a smart fan? Yes. Yeah. Um, a mark just, I mean, and for full disclosure, the term mark, if you don't know, comes from the old carnival days when you would walk into the front of the carnival and you would say the the carnival is four dollars admission. When you open your wallet up. The guy taking your money would look in your wallet. He wouldn't even look at the money. He would look at your wallet, see what you had in there, what kind, you know, what kind of credit card you had, what kind of money yeah. you had. And if you had a pocket full of money, he would then give the Iggy to the guy there who would walk up and hey, have chalk on his hand, and he would pat you in the back and go, good luck, guy, thus marking you. So then all the gamesmen would know, this guy's got a pocket full of money. Let me try to take advantage of him. Let me separate the mark from his money. Right. That's, the, that's where it started. Right. So, you know, maybe the original definition is the marks of rude, but I, I don't like that. I, I think, like, I like fan, I like smart fan, I like right. intelligent fan, I like, I like people who enjoy our sport um, and, and on some level, they wish they were doing it too. Yeah, I, 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 full disclosure, I'm a mark, that's why I'm in this business. <laughs> we, we all, like, whenever you see me in a ring, sitting at an announce desk, um, whatever, imagine my nine-year-old self is sitting there because that's what I am at my yeah. core yeah. when I'm doing it. My nine-year-old self is loving life. Absolutely. Brother, again, we're going to have you on again because I know you're going to catch a flight in the morning and, and we we got about, uh, not a, probably about 10,000 more things we need to talk about. <laughs> but uh, Let's do it. It's great seeing you again, brother. Love it you, Shane. Love you, brother. Very much. Love you. Thank you. Good seeing you, brother.